The text this morning is from Acts chapter 2, starting at verse 14. These are the words of God. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Ye ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Him, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy without, with thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulchre is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne, he, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Father in God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the blessing it is to us, and I pray that your Holy Spirit would take that word and make it even more of a blessing to us. We pray in Jesus' name, in the strong name of of Christ. Amen. Amen. So we saw last week that the gift of tongues was a marvelous blessing for those who had ears to hear. If you had ears to hear, if your heart was circumcised, if you were regenerate, if you were open to the ways of God, the gift of tongues enabled you to hear the blessings of God, the marvelous works of God, declared in your own language. And even if you were uh, a resident of Jerusalem and you saw it being declared to the Egyptians and the Parthians and so on, that was a marvelous thing, and everyone rejoiced to see it. The gift of tongues The gift of Pentecost, the day of Pentecost, was a day of rejoicing, considered from the the vantage point of a believer. For believers, the point was all about the grace of God and the wonderful works of God. But we also saw that for unbelievers, the reality of gibberish in the streets of Jerusalem should have been beyond creepy. It was, what's going on? What's what's happening here? And if you refused to accept what was happening, you didn't receive it with a believing heart, you would make some sort of joke about it. They're drunk. These guys are out of their minds. But if they'd known the meaning of Scripture, they would have heard the ominous music of a soundtrack. The ominous music began at this point for unbelievers. They were on the threshold of their doom, and the first indication that they were on the threshold of this doom was the fact of these foreign languages being spoken in their streets. Now, we've already seen how Luke set the stage uh, for recording Peter's sermon. Um, in fact, the Holy Spirit set the stage by, pouring out the, uh, by being poured out upon them. But Luke sets the stage in the beginning of, cha- of, of chapter 2. 
In English, the sermon that Peter preaches here takes about two and a half minutes to speak. But it says later, down in verse 40, that Peter spoke many words in the follow-up. There was a, an epic Q&A, apparently. There was a follow-up, and Peter spoke many words there. Now, given the nature of the case, I thought it was important to take all of Peter's sermon in one go. So the first part of the chapter, the Holy Spirit is poured out, the gift of tongues is given, and we have a description of that. Then a multitude gathers, and Peter preaches a sermon in that instant, in that situation, telling everybody what this means. All right, what, what is this all about? That's what the sermon does. What, is, what does all this mean? And then, in the aftermath of the, ser uh, of the sermon, we're going to consider in a future message what happened, the thousands that were converted, and what happened then. So, let's consider a summary of the text. Peter stands up, and with a loud voice, he got the attention of these men of Judea and residents of Jerusalem. Verse 14. Keep in mind that this is a historic event. It happens at a particular time, and the place where it happens helps fill out what it means. You cannot transfer this event to any other moment in history and have it mean the same thing. This is an event, uh, this is a unique historical event. He responds to the charge of drunkenness first. That couldn't be it, he argued, because it was only around 9 a.m. Uh, that they would have, would have had to start really early. That's verse 15. These events, he says, were actually a fulfillment of a prophecy from Joel. He says that in verse 16. And in Joel, it's from Joel 2, 28 through 32, which he then quotes. So verses 17 through 21 is his quotation of the prophet Joel. Now, please note the entirety of what he quotes. You, he doesn't just quote the happy part. He doesn't just quote the part where young men see visions, and, and uh, he doesn't quote that part and then stop. He quotes the whole passage, and, the whole, and this is because what's happening there on Pentecost is fulfilled in that entire passage. So note the entirety of it. So first, God is going to pour out his Spirit on all flesh, Sons, daughters, young men, old men, verse 17, not to mention male and female slaves prophesying. That's in verse 18. That is the first portent. The first portent is the Holy Spirit being poured out all over. The second portent is the disintegration of heaven, earth, sun, and moon leading up to the great and terrible day of the Lord. That's the second portent. The first portent is the visions, the tongues, the, uh, the, what they're seeing there in the streets of Jerusalem. And then the second portent is the disintegration of the cosmos, um, the way we might put it, thunder, lightning, and blue ruin. Everything comes unstuck. Everything comes undone. So in this context, and it's important that you note that it's in this context, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Verse 21. Whoever calls on God in this moment is going to be saved. Now, what Peter was describing was all the same event. It's, he's, everything, he's, he says to them, this whole thing, this whole thing that I just quoted, this is what you now see and hear. Now, that's why it's important, what we considered last week, that, that what Isaiah said in Isaiah 28 about tongues being a sign of judgment on unbelief. Tongues being a sign that if you don't know what's going on and all you hear is, you know, uh, the prophet came to America in the Cold War and told us our sins over and over. And we said, yeah, 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 yeah. And then finally said, well, maybe you'll understand it in Russian. Maybe you'll understand it when your enemy fills up your streets and is speaking in a language you don't recognize. That's what Isaiah is talking about in Isaiah 28. That's what Paul says tongues is all about in 1 Corinthians 14. And then Peter anchors this point. Uh, he just screws the same point down tight. It's all the same event. The tongue speaking was the overture, and the fall of Jerusalem was the crescendo, but it was all one symphonic composition. It was one symphony. So the tongue speaking is the, the first notes. Okay, this is going to be interesting. Certain themes are introduced. God's people recognize certain wonderful things about it, and they rejoice. But the people who don't get it, the people who don't understand, it's going to be a terrible, terrible time down the road. So those who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. 
That's Joel 2.32. And incidentally, while we're here, um, in Joel, the, the Lord there is Yahweh. Yahweh. Um, and here in the Greek, it's kurios. It's the Lord Jesus. So Jesus is Jehovah. Jesus is Yahweh. Those who call on the name of Yahweh will be saved. And those who call on the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved. So who, who will this Savior be? If you call on the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. But who is the Savior? These men of Israel already knew that Jesus of Nazareth was certainly attested by God through many miracles and signs. Verse 22. They, they knew Jesus had spent at least three years traveling in Judea, Jerusalem, Galilee, uh, Samaria. He, was, he spent three years um, doing these miracles, casting out demons. He walked on water. He turned water to wine. He raised Lazarus from the dead. Uh, this was not done in secret. It was done over the course of years, and everybody in Jerusalem knew about it. And they knew that this meant that he was a prophet attested by God. And he came to Jerusalem, and they killed him. That's what happened. They came to Jerusalem, and they killed him. The death of this Jesus, also not a secret, was not a divine misfire. And that's an, that's an important point to emphasize. Christ was crucified, it says, by wicked hands, Peter says, but it was also in accordance with the settled plan of God. Verse 23, God determined that it would go this way, and it was, going, and it was accomplished by wicked men. Wicked men did it, but God determined it. God then raised him from the dead because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Verse 24. It was impossible for death to contain this man. Now, I want you to note something, and this, is, this has to do with all of this being a harbinger of doom. There, I can only imagine one thing worse than conspiring to murder a righteous man like this. Uh, attested by God, miracle worker, do, going about the land, doing good, and then you're so corrupt and you're so wicked that you conspire to have him murdered. There's only one thing worse than that, and that would be to do that and have the person you murdered come back from the dead. That would be worse. And, and for you to know that he had come back from the dead. Remember, the guards went and told the people who had... Uh, who had railroaded the Lord, they knew that Jesus rose from the dead. The guards were the first to know, and the people who murdered him were the second group to know. The women were the third to know, and the disciples were the fourth to know. So God raised him from the dead because it was impossible for death to contain him. This also was prophesied beforehand. Psalm 16, 8 through 11. So th this passage from Psalm 16 is cited by Peter. David saw the Lord who was on his right hand such that he would not be moved. Verse 25. This was the source of David's gladness and hope. Verse 26. His soul would not be left in Sheol, Hades, and the Holy One would not see corruption. Verse 27. You remember that Lazarus had been in the grave for four days, and Martha was worried that he had already begun to decompose. The Lord has been four days. Jesus was in the grave for three days. He would not see corruption. It's also, some of your translations say, his soul will not be left in hell. Uh, the Greek is Hades. In the Old Testament, in Psalm 16, the Hebrew is Sheol. Sheol, Hades are not the same thing as Gehenna, not the same thing as the final judgment, not the same thing as the lake of fire. Jesus did not descend into the lake of fire. He didn't descend into Gehenna. He died and his soul went to Hades where he, um, uh, he preached to the spirits in prison, as it says in Peter, elsewhere. So this is not the Lord. This is the Lord in the place of uh, the dead, the, the, the place of the dead, not the place of final judgment. But he wouldn't be there long. He's not going to see corruption. The, uh, and after he comes back from the dead in Revelation, it says, Behold, I hold the keys of death and Hades. So Jesus broke out of death, broke out of Hades from the inside. The way of life is revealed, and it is joy in the presence of God. Verse 28. Peter comments on this passage, saying that David could not have been talking about himself. When David composed Psalm 16, he could not have been talking about himself because his grave was still right there in Jerusalem. Verse 29. If, uh, remember, Jerusalem is a, a pilgrimage city. If you came to Jerusalem 
uh, Peter says, you can go over to this side of town and see the sepulcher of David, which is still here. David was dead, uh, died and was buried, and he's still buried here. Psalm 16 is not talking about David's body not seeing corruption. As a prophet, he was actually saying that a descendant of his would be raised from the dead in order to sit on the throne of David, that's verse 30, and that this had in fact been sealed with an oath from God. The Christ would be killed, but would not decompose, and would rather be raised, verse 31. Jesus was raised, and all these men speaking in tongues were eyewitnesses of his having been raised, verse 32. This risen Christ, now ascended to the right hand of the Father, received the Holy Spirit from the Father, and then poured him out, verse 33, on his followers. Again, this is not referring to David. For how did David speak of his descendant? Uh, Peter now cites Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. Jesus stumped uh, his uh, antagonists with this question. Whose son is the Messiah? Well, David's son. So how, did, how then did David say, my Lord? How, how, how is it that a David's son, a descendant of David, is spoken to with such respect by David? Why would David speak to his own great-great-great-grandson by saying him, calling him Lord? The only way that question can be answered is by means of incarnation. God chose the line of David to have the second person of the Trinity be born into. So you have the incarnation, the God-man is a descendant of David. Because he's God, David can address him as Lord. Because he is man, we can say of according to the flesh, in, in Romans 1.4, it says according to the flesh of the seed of David. He was declared with power to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead, and he is the seed of David according to the flesh. So according to his humanity, he's a Davidson. According to his divinity, he is divine. He is almighty God. And this is why David speaks to him and of him the way he does. So that's verses 34 and 35 and Psalm 110, verse 1. And this is why the entire house of David needs, uh, excuse me, this is why the entire house of Israel needs to be assured of the fact that God has made this very Jesus, the one crucified a couple of months before in that same city, both Lord and Christ, verse 36. So all of this is fresh. All of it is fresh. Jesus had been traveling for three years. The triumphal entry was just a few months before. Jesus was then railroaded and crucified, and that was no secret. Everybody knew what had happened after the fact. The, the triumphal entry crowds were outmaneuvered. They were, uh, they were uh, at, home, at home in bed while the uh, the bad guys had brought Jesus very early in the morning, it says in the Gospel of John, before Pilate. And so they were outmaneuvered. Jesus was killed. And then Jesus had appeared, we piecing all these things together, Jesus had appeared to over 500 people. Uh, and with many infallible proofs, it shown that he it was indeed this same Jesus. So what does this mean? And that's what Peter's talking about. That's what Peter is announcing in this moment. Now, I think that you can understand that these people who are listening are kind of raw, right? And Peter doesn't hold back. You, you guys, with wicked hands, you crucified. He, sa he says this um, in the last verse, in verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified... You people, you people killed him. And then the same thing was said earlier, him being delivered up by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified. You are the murderers. You are the ones who did this thing. And you did it in the teeth of God's astonishing kindness to you. Here was a man who traveled throughout Israel casting out demons. Here was a man who was healing lepers. Here was a man who was healing epileptics. Here's the man who went around doing nothing but good. And the one thing you thought was bad was him challenging the corruption of the establishment. That was the, that, you didn't like that part. But he did nothing but good. And so he came to Jerusalem X number of weeks ago, and you killed him. Let me tell you what this means. It means you're in trouble. That's what it means. It means you're in trouble. So, 
How do we unpack this? One common form of prophetic de uh, declaration is something that I call a collapsing solar system language, collapsing solar system language. And I, I need to explain something before I go any further because we are very accustomed to it in our own language, but when, we're, when we go to the Bible, we sometimes think if someone says, points this out, we think there's some sort of spiritualizing going on or some kind of uh, hermeneutical funny business. It's not funny business at all. If you imagine a, um, a foreign student uh, who studied English all the way through high school and his textbook English, his grammar English was perfect, better than yours in fact, right? So he, he, he studied English, he got all A's all the way through high school. He comes here to go to college and he runs smack into American slang for the first time. He runs into idioms and expressions. And the idioms don't mean what the dictionary would, t would indicate that they mean. They don't mean that at all. And so he's gonna be thrown for a complete loss. He comes, his, he comes and addresses you after a weekend. You, you work together and he says, how was your weekend? And it was a rainy weekend. And you said, oh no, it was a, man, uh, it rained all weekend. I had cabin fever by the end of it. And he says, cabin fever, this is interesting. What does cabin fever mean? And you say, you know, I was stir crazy. And he's got his dictionary, he's looking up stir, stir crazy. I, I still don't understand. You know, I was going nuts. I was going nuts. And he's blank. You know, I was beside myself. Now you all understand, beside myself, going nuts, stir crazy, climbing the walls. I was climbing, climbing the walls. You say, well, now what, is, what does an idiom mean? An idiom does not mean what the words literally say. An idiom means what it means. It, an idiom means how you're using it, right? So if you said, look, I was exasperated with how rainy it was because I had planned on having a picnic. Right? You explain it in words that he can look up in the dictionary, and then he associates all the idioms that you used with that literal explanation. Now what we have to do when we encounter collapsing solar system language in the Bible is follow that procedure. This is not anything mystical. This is simply how human language works. The sun goes dark, the moon turns blood red, and all the stars fall like ripe figs in a windstorm. This kind of language occurs frequently in the Old Testament, and there are a number of striking places in the New Testament where these places are cited and repeated and applied to the same thing. All right? The New Testament quotes the Old Testament and uses the same kind of language, and it uses the same kind of language talking about the same kind of thing. Bible, caller, uh, Bible scholars call this kind of language decreation language. Decreation language. In scripture, it has a very specific kind of meaning, and that meaning is, is one kind of meaning. Just like stir crazy, going nuts, climbing the walls, it has one meaning. It's got all sorts of ways of saying it, but one meaning. Many ordinary Christians, taking the Bible at face value, and that by itself is, that's a good thing, but they take the Bible at face value, they go out and look at the night sky, and because everything is still up there, the moon's still up there, the stars are still up there, and they just saw the sun go down, they simply assume that these prophecies are yet to be fulfilled in our future. Because if they had been fulfilled, then the sky would be empty, right? That everything would be gone. But this ignores what that language meant in the Old Testament. What did, how is this language used? The places are Joel 2, 28 through 32, cited by Peter here. And in Joel, it means the same thing that it means in Peter's sermon. Amos 8, 9, Ezekiel 32, 7. Isaiah 13.10, and Isaiah 34.4. What do these expressions refer to? Throughout the Old Testament, they always, no exceptions, they always refer to the destruction of a city or nation. That's what these expressions mean. They always refer to the, to the destruction of a city or nation. Take, for example, Isaiah 13.10. Back in verse 1 of Isaiah 13, what does it say? The oracle concerning Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos saw. And then it goes down, and then you have the decreation language in verse 10. What are we talking about, Isaiah? Babylon. That's what we're talking about. Babylon's going down. That's what Isaiah 13 is about. 
In Joel 2, it's talking about Israel. In Amos, it's talking about the northern kingdom of Israel. In Ezekiel, it's talking about Egypt. In Isaiah 13, it's talking about Babylon. And in Isaiah 34, it's talking about Edom. Always means the same thing. Now, the meaning of such expressions does not change in the New Testament. Remember that the disciples had asked Jesus when the promised destruction of Jerusalem was going to occur, and part of his reply was to quote Isaiah 13 and Isaiah 34. It all means the same thing. They were walking around the temple complex, and the disciples were rubbernecking. They were just looking at everything because it really was an astonishing uh, bit of architecture. covered like 30 acres, the co complex did. The temple itself was one small portion of it, but it was plated in gold. It was reported that if you were on the Mount of Olives across from Jerusalem and the sun was shining on the temple, you couldn't look at it because it was too bright. It was too dazzlingly bright. And it was huge. It was enormous. It was impressive. If you go there and look at the ruins of it, it's impressive now. It's impressive today. And Jesus says to them, do you see all this? Not one stone is going to be left on another. Not one stone is going to be left on another. The disciples come back to him and say, when? When's this going to happen? He tells them, within one generation, right, that's one thing, this generation will not pass away until all these, all these things are fulfilled. And then the thing that throws people is that Jesus quotes Isaiah 13 and Isaiah 34 when he's talking about this in Matthew 24. But if you know what the prophetic language means, you know that he's, all, he's talking about when this is all going to happen. It's going to happen in 70 A.D., it all means the same thing. So he's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. The Lord is, Peter is, Joel is. They're all talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. They are not talking about the dissolution of the space-time continuum. They are not talking about the end of the world. They are talking about the end of Jerusalem. Now, there, the Bible does speak of the end of the world elsewhere in other terms, but that's not here. Now, we saw, from, we saw last week from Isaiah 28 that the gift of tongues was a portent of destruction for Jerusalem. And Peter's sermon, immediately following, makes this explicit. Trouble was certainly brewing. He quotes a passage from Joel, and that passage had two elements. One was the Spirit being poured out voluminously on God's people, and the other was the great, the great cataclysm. But in Peter's message, these two elements were all of a piece. In his message, he quotes one passage, and that passage has a beginning and an end. And what he's talking about is this, all of this is fulfilled today. So Peter's message, these two elements were all of a piece. Pentecost in, in 30 AD and the destruction in 70 AD were all the same event. They were all the great and terrible day of the Lord. We have no business dividing these two events, the happy event in the tongues and the tragic event in the destruction of Jerusalem. We cannot divide them. It's all the same. Now, this is what's happening. Here's an image to, to think of. This city, the rulers of this city, had done the horrible thing. The Messiah of God had come and they'd killed him. The Christ had come and they'd killed him. They had lied about him. They had betrayed him. They had they were, the, they were the architects and builders of the city, and they rebelled against the owner of the vineyard, they, the, the, the owner of the whole project. They, they didn't want to have him rule over them, so they killed him. What's happening is Jesus came back from the dead, ascended into heaven, and was given universal dominion. He was also given the Holy Spirit, which he poured out on his followers. And his followers were miraculously empowered to start doing the same kinds of things that he did. And that's what you're going to see in the early parts of Acts, you know, uh, uh, raising the dead and, and uh, healing cripples. And all of a sudden, what, what the bad guys had done is they had multiplied Jesus. Right? They, they were dealing with one, and now all of a sudden they're dealing with the whole band of them. Now, what's happening here is that God's armies laid siege to Jerusalem in 30 AD with the city completely surrounded. Those armies that surrounded Jerusalem were all speaking in different languages. That's Pentecost. They were speaking the language of the Egyptians and the Romans and the Parthians. They were all speaking in different languages, just like Isaiah talked about. The res and in this situation, and this is the astonishing thing, the residents of Jerusalem, besieged now, were given an opportunity to surrender. Surrender. 
God offers them terms. He offers them terms. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That is the occasion. That is the moment where he says that. If you come out, you will be forgiven. Come out. When the city finally falls, it's all the culmination of it beginning with this siege. So Peter is the lead general. Peter is standing outside the city walls. And he says, call on the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. Everyone. Who's he speaking to? At the beginning of this, he says, ye men of Judea and ye that dwell in Jerusalem. Do you live here? Are you from Judea? Who's, uh, this invitation is dressed, directed to whom? Could you have been a member of the Sanhedrin that voted against Christ and listened to this and respond to this? Yes. Could you have been one of the men who drove the nails in and respond to this and come out and receive mercy? Yes. Could you have been one of those who mocked him when he was hanging on the cross? Come down and save yourself and then have a change of heart and come out and be forgiven? Yes. Jesus on the cross says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. They don't have any idea what they're doing. And if God gave them the insight to finally realize what they had done, anybody in Jerusalem who came out would be forgiven. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So we do not just preach that Jesus was raised from the dead. We also declare what it means that he was raised from the dead. The risen Christ pours out his spirit promiscuously. He is not dispensed with a teaspoon. The risen Christ will visit terrible desolations on the city that murdered him. But then, when he comes to reckon with that city, he offers terms. He offers mercy. He says, I will forgive you, and I will forgive you for anything. If, if you could be forgiven for that, for murdering the Christ, do you think anything else is beyond reach? Do you... If Jesus could pray for forgiveness for his murderers, his actual murderers, do you think that he is going to stop or hesitate or hang back because of our sins? Because ultimately, all of our sins are, were contributed to that murder, right? So the risen Christ is going to visit terrible desolations on the city that murdered him. The risen Christ offers terms to anyone who is willing to call on the name of the Lord. Mercy is extended in the midst of the day of wrath. So the day of wrath has started. The day of wrath has been inaugurated. And God says, still, come. Still, listen. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart the way you did in the wilderness. You, there's still time. Come on out. We've laid siege to the city. The thing is done. The gift of tongues is given. The die is cast. But you can still come. The risen Christ had been identified beforehand by God through abundant miracles, but then betrayed to murderers by the glorious foreordination of God. Christ was predestined to be murdered. The determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God had determined that he would be murdered, and God does it without sullying his hands, but the men that did it, did it with wicked hands. So the risen Christ was raised in accordance with what Scripture had said a millennium before. David lived a millennium before. Isaiah was 700 years before. Joel was centuries before. All of this was laid out. All of this was determined. The risen Christ is on the throne of David, which is the throne of the world. And so it is that the risen Christ cannot be received as anything other than Lord and Christ. God, as it says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. There is no other option. Christ is risen. Christ is therefore Lord. Christ is risen. Christ is therefore Lord. Now, that means that mercy is extended to you. Right? Because the, these disciples are told to navigate their preaching and their teaching up through the destruction of Jerusalem in a particular way. And then after that point, they're supposed to fan out and disciple all the nations of men. And the same principles apply. You might feel pretty tawdry. You might feel pretty dirty. You might feel pretty corrupt. You may have done all sorts of things that other people don't know about. You might feel like a world-class hypocrite. But think about the terms that were offered to 
to the people who flogged him, to the people who drove the nails in, to the soldier who rammed the spear in, to the men who gave the silver to Judas. God has forgiven, God has offered forgiveness to way worse than you. God has offered forgiveness to anyone who hears his voice, anyone who hears his word, anyone. It doesn't, you say, but I have, you know, I've been guilty of this. I've, been, I've, I've, I've had an abortion. I've been involved in sexual immorality. I've been involved in homosexual immorality. I've been involved in this. Christ says, come. The, the spirit and the bride say, come. Everyone, everyone should hear this word, come. You have, there is nothing about your sinfulness that can provide a barrier to coming. The only, thing that, the only thing that interferes is that moment of rebellion that does not want to let go of that sinfulness, that wants to hang on to the sinfulness. The issue is not what you did in the past. The issue is insistence upon hanging on to it now. That's the issue. Now is the moment. Today is the day. Now is the time. And so... We thank our Father. Father, we thank you for all you give us. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the sermon that Peter preached here. We thank you for the courage and the boldness that you gave to him. We thank you for all of this in Jesus' name. He is the one who taught us to pray, saying, So God's judgment and mercy are cut from the same fabric. You live in a time of judgment where the Lord is in the process of shaking things up so that only that which is unshakable can remain. But remember that God's promise to save still stands. Joel chapter 2 verse 32. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord calls. In this Lord's Day service, but particularly in this meal set before you, you are built up together as a holy temple and raised to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to the throne of grace where mercy reigns, where the lamb who was slain sits exalted and worshiped by myriads of angels and saints. In that heavenly mount, by the once for all broken body and blood of the Son of God whom we murdered, stands for you immovable promises of deliverance and redemption. Know that everything around you, this building, this town, the companies that you own or work for, will pass away. But this stable, the stable will be set uh, over and over, will continue to be laid till the end of time, till Christ returns. Believe in the power of the blood that flowed from the cross, and come to the rock of ages. Come and welcome to Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Our Lord Christ, you are worthy to take the scroll of God's judgment and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made kings and priests, made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. And amen. The charge is this. It all comes down in every person's life. It always comes down to the, to the decisive moment where you say yes to God or no. It's either yes or no. It's that simple. Yes or no. You're standing on the walls of Jerusalem, besieged by the Pentecostal armies of the Lord, and you're offered terms. You say yes or no. Now, if you say, and we, we come up with all kinds of evasions and shifts and excuses for saying no, we'll say things like, I, I'm just not good enough. But what you're saying when you say no, you're not saying you're not good enough. You're saying Christ is not good enough. That's what it is. It all comes down, is Christ good enough? Not are you good enough to be saved, because none of us are. Right? We don't deserve it. We, no, no one is good enough for Christ. But is Christ good enough for you? Is Christ good enough for a sinner? And the answer, of course, is yes. The only answer, the only response, the only sensible response to that is yes, Lord. And so with believing hearts, receive the benediction of your God. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. And amen.